So today I'm here to talk about uh, cryptographic lineage and context for um, for the uh, for securing AI, uh, specifically generative AI. Um, so how many here are familiar with the concepts of Spiffy and Spire? Good, uh, awesome. So this uh, talk uh, focuses on uh, bits and pieces of Spiffy and Spire. So uh, I won't. Uh, I won't delve too much into that because there are like almost like nine talks uh, at this conference that focus on Spiffy and Spire. Um, so let me get started. Um, my name is Yogi Porla, and uh, my background is in cybersecurity and operations. I did lead uh, AI strategy at AT&T Labs before, um, and most recently I've been uh, engaged in the uh, Spiffy community. Uh, I'm, I'm working for a small startup, uh, which is actually focusing on uh, artistic claims. And uh, recently there was a consortium, uh, IETF consortium, uh, called Whimsy, uh, which is the workload identity in multi-system environments. Uh, we'll talk about, so this work was uh, partial, uh, it has been, um, while well, this work has been ongoing for the last two years, uh, most recently, IETF, uh, there is a charter that has formed to uh, take, take this to, a, uh, to the next stage. So we'll talk about that community as well. So key takeaways today are, uh, first let's talk about, briefly talk about the security challenges with uh, modern AI, uh, specifically um, when it comes to the generative AI space. Uh, we'll also um, give a slight introduction to Zero Trust and Spiffy. Uh, uh, but then we'll dive into uh, something called delegated assertions and how do you build context uh, for, uh, for the uh, whole zero trust for AI. Now, uh, please note that while this uh, talk focuses on AI, this uh, uh, capability could be leveraged for even non-AI applications as well. Uh, we'll go into a brief demo and then I'll also uh, talk about the community and how you could contribute to this. Um, so this morning I was actually reading a uh, McKinsey article. Uh, what you see here is at least a year old. And um, there were a lot of risks. And when McKinsey surveyed like 1,600 uh, large organizations uh, of the survey, many actually said that they were afraid of adapting uh, generative AI. And unfortunately, uh, this morning though, uh, same McKinsey report uh, stated that the adaption has been rapid. Um, almost 65% of the respondents said that they have adopted this generative AI in some sort of form. Um, however, uh, the, some of the biggest concerns there are the uh, IP infringement, cybersecurity, and uh, regulatory risks associated with that. But also the significant risk is uh, who is responsible when AI goes wrong? Um, so uh, what has changed uh, with AI is that uh, the system has, uh, the typical IT ecosystem has gotten uh, much more broader. Um, there are a lot of components that are involved. So as you, as you can see here today, in majority of the uh, generative AI cases, you're just throwing in a bunch of data. Uh, it's your own corporate's data, but also data from external entities. So, and what that brings in is the risk of leakage, right? So you have, uh, you do have, oh, and one key aspect to remember here is once AI learns something, it cannot unlearn it. So if you are a corporate and you're putting your data out there, uh, there is a huge risk that, that has, uh, there is this IP, uh, IP leak and there is also an infringement data infringement there. And you also don't know what your corporate data entails, right? You could have uh, PHIs or EHRs uh, or whatever, which are actually leaking to the public. Then there is other uh, segment of this risk, which is, uh, let's say you, you put together uh, a fantastic AI um, and um, uh, without proper safeguards, there are numerous cases where your, um, your entire AI, AI could be polluted. A simple example, it starts with a prompt injection, right? Uh, a, you could actually um, 
give a false prompt to, uh, to confuse AI, to yield uh, some uh, unusual results. Or it could be like uh, data poisoning, model poisoning. Um, and at the same time, there's also a notion of, if at all, um, somehow you tend to use some other's technology, there could be a copyright case on your entity, right? So AI has actually added lots of challenges to uh, your existing IT ecosystem. There are a lot of uh, compliance risks, regulatory risks, and um, in addition to the cybersecurity risks. So how do we deal with this, right? So your traditional security model, uh, what we do is we, we do buy firewalls. Or nowadays, um, you do buy, there are a lot of AI tools to secure AI. However, uh, what if we thought differently? And what if we started looking uh, at the security from the ground up, from the foundation of it? Like protect the data wherever it is. It could be uh, at the user's level, it could be at a system level, or it could be at uh, network level, right, or in transport. Uh, so if we start with that notion, and if we try to go and secure every component of it, then uh, we could actually see it differently. So when it comes to AI, uh, zero trust is necessary. Zero trust is mandatory. And there are some frameworks that are put together, uh, put forward by the NSA uh, and CSA. Uh, like for example, um, NIST AI RMF is one framework. And uh, there was an article from Gartner called AI Trism, which talks about multiple um, uh, AI framework, uh, trust, risk, and security management models. Uh, those are some really good references, but NIST AI RMF is also another good reference. Uh, they do call for some uh, zero trust. So what is the path for zero trust for AI, right? Uh, we could start with something like a point to point zero trust, which is, yeah, we go establish zero trust uh, foundation principles and then go uh, to the next level. Uh, and the, the next step is chained custody, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And from the chain custody, how can you get, uh, how can you incorporate contextual awareness? Um, I know uh, I'm also keeping a tab on the time here, so I'll be rushing through the next slides because I want to get to the demo. Uh, so some of you are familiar with Zero Trust and Spiffy. So traditional security models today, uh, they still use legacy technologies with uh, uh, a moat uh, structure. So you, you have this beautiful castle, you protect it with moat, and what if that attack happens from the inside, right? Some person um, could actually start attacking uh, inside the castle and you wouldn't know. And that's what is happening today because if we look at uh, sp uh, spoof attacks, or if we look at user assimilation, uh, user assimilation attacks, and then uh, lateral movement attacks. Uh, these are happening because today's traditional security approaches think that, oh, user has been verified, so I can just trust the user blindly. Or uh, you, my firewall let in some uh, request, so I can trust my firewall. And unfortunately, with uh, the cybersecurity approach today, there are nearly thousands of tools that you have to trust so what if we started with, okay, I'm not going to trust anything. I'm not going to trust a user or a system or a, I, uh, or a process, right? Uh, this is where uh, principles of zero trust come in. And again, you could see vendors selling you layer seven zero trust or uh, database zero trust, right? Uh, unfortunately, um, that's not how it works. Zero trust is more about a principle where you don't trust anything. And however, you do have to trust something, right? So what is the mechanism that entails you to trust something? Uh, it's very, um, uh, uh, very process-oriented. Basically, you start with, I'm going to attest uh, either it could be a workload, user, or a process. And I'm going to verify that, uh, that it is who they say they are, or it is what it says it is. And then add some provenance to it, um, add provenance and short lived credentials, right? So you, you can have combination of uh, all these features to form a zero trust. And today, uh, the uh, cloud, adoption of cloud and um, 
and containers, they are driving the adoption of zero trust. So zero trust assumes that bad guys are everywhere. They use cryptographic identities. And please note that in zero trust, it's not about the cryptographic identity, but it's how you guard that identity. That's the most important thing. Because if you're attested, if you're verified, only then you're given an identity to be able to communicate with others. Um, so Spiffy and Spider are some really good projects out there. Um, Spiffy is a specification and Spider is an implementation. And I won't go uh, deep into this. So some of the key attributes of Spiffy are short-lived credentials, attestation. They do have attestors for a lot of um, public cloud providers, but also even for uh, some languages and even hardware-based attestation as well. Uh, the key features here are short-lived credentials. There are some customers out there, like there are some implementations who rotate their credentials every one hour. And in our demo, we rotate certificates every uh, 60 seconds, uh, but you can actually uh, use those short-lived credentials. But then all these are cryptographic in nature. You have MTLS everywhere. And most importantly, it's platform agnostic. So these are the many uh, providers that actually rely on um, uh, Spiffy. Uh, most recently, you've seen some announcements from AWS and Azure who are adapting Spiffy as the foundation for service identity. Uh, Spiffy comes in two flavors. One is uh, open source Spire, and then the other one is the commercial Spiral, but they do contribute a lot to Spire. So, um, so let's get to the next concept of delegated authentication context, right? So what's missing today in a traditional application or even in the AI space is that uh, when a user is actually doing a transaction, uh, once again, with a traditional model, we assume that yeah, user has been taken care of, so we're going to just trust it blindly. And when the request travels all the way to the data, you don't have the context of where did this user come from? What process did it run through? And the reason it is a cumbersome process and the reason it's not implemented is because you have a lot of tools uh, at each of the providers. Like, for example, in the user space, you have uh, OAuth and OIDC providers, right? And then in the service space, you have uh, some non-uniform service identities, and each cloud has its own way of representing these identities. So how can you bring all this together, right? And this is where the delegated authentication context comes in. So by the time a service reaches C, if you have an entire um, context of where did the request travel from, what service did it go through, uh, and how did it get there, uh, that would be amazing. Because ne then you can actually make dynamic decisions based on that context information. The second one is the runtime context. So it's all great to uh, say that um, a user has actually logged in from his office using a trusted device, and the service went from A to B to C. But majority of the hacks that are happening today is because one of those parameters could change. Like, for example, SolarWinds, Log4j, right? Or a user spoofing or service spoofing, right? So what is the runtime context that you are in? So if I can confidently say that the request that user A made has traveled through a service that has been SALSA certified uh, that is running on a signed image, and it is secure, and the service is going from A to B to C, and at B, we, we are using a hardware attestation, and be able to make the decision with that data, that would be gold, because then you're getting into a context-based access control, which is the next generation access control where you're putting together the attributes, but you're also putting together the context, the real runtime context of how you're going to access this data. So uh, here is how we went about working on this idea. Uh, so let's assume that you have, um, uh, you have user who is accessing data and it's going from A to B to C. So what uh, our uh, underlying assumption is that we are going to start with a foundation of zero trust, which is uh, all these services. And it, this is going to be the demo where um, we are going to show you that A, B, and C are all attested using Spiffy. So for the sake of our demo, uh, 
uh, and for the sake of our pr proof of concept, we attested user, we attested a user's device. We are using some simple attestations, like for example, CI/CD. We are using a test device witness, uh, test device X witness, uh, to actually sign uh, sign that artifact. Uh, and then for Service A, we are using Salsa uh, software supply chain levels and SIM. There was also one service that was attested using the OpenSSF scorecard. Um, so let's say you've attested that and you've you found the foundation of all these services using zero trust. Now, uh, I wanted to show you how the contextual chain works. Now, uh, remember this, with the foundation of zero trust, what you have accomplished is that every connection there is zero trust, which is, um, uh, it, it's actually going to be frequently rotated credentials and the connection is MTLS everywhere. So in the context chain, what we are going to do is we are going to take user's information and sign that. And as the request is traveling through, you keep on saying that here is the user and user A is talking to service, uh, user is talking to service A and the next hop is going to be service B. And that has been signed and attested. And you create a signature, uh, concatenation signature. So we are using something uh, called a Schnarr concatenation algorithm, but we have multiple modes. We have an identity mode and an anonymous mode. So I won't talk into, uh, I won't talk about those today because of time. Uh, however, there are multiple ways of doing this. Um, so as the request is traveling through, what we have here is a cryptographic identity document that says, this is the user that came in and talked to service A, and now the service A is talking to B, and here is the signature to verify the sanctity of user and A, and I could only use this authentication and this key to talk to the next service. So as the request travels through, we have all the context, we have all the cryptographic verification and lineage. To prove that, nothing has been tampered with, uh, uh, and there hasn't been any um, uh, there hasn't been any uh, data injections or prompt injections or service uh, interference as the request is traveling through. So how does this apply in the AI environments, right? So what we uh, are building to now is a simple proxy, which is going to be uh, open source. Uh, it's an on-my proxy. So if you're running your AI components in Kubernetes environments, you could just deploy this. And this proxy is talking to Spire and um, also to, uh, to the attested claims plugin. Uh, it's actually deploying the zero trust principles at each and every service. And then let's say user comes in and does a prompt, like uh, tell me about CNCF, right? Uh, then what we are doing is we are taking that, uh, 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 those tokens and we are actually creating a chain of custody uh, where as the request is traveling through, we are verifying each and every aspect of that communication. And we are signing each and every uh, aspect of communication saying that nothing has been tampered with, there has been no data injection, there has been no uh, prompt poisoning. And let's say you're building your own models using our, this proxy, it even tells you, gives you what data exactly went in in training that model. So, uh, the, uh, basically, using, using this model in the generative AI space, you get an entire digest of how your communications are happening uh, with the foundation of security. Because every component there is a zero trust based component. Uh, suddenly, you don't actually have the need to use your VPNs, firewalls, because suddenly every communication has become a, a zero trust endpoint. And the credentials here are all certificate based. So there are the notion of service accounts and passwords to connect between services has gone. So uh, as an example, recently Spiral, uh, they came out with an open source version of Spiffy, using Spiffy to connect to vector data stores. And uh, we also have a lot of plugins, a uh, lot of open source plugins where you could connect with uh, uh, like a Oracle or Microsoft a SQL Server using zero trust authentication where you can get rid of all your passwords. So uh, with respect to time, let me go to the demo uh, here. In demo, what's happening is we have a simple um, uh, like subject workload, middle tier, and target. Target workload is communicating with the OpenAI. 
uh, but it could be anything, right? And then in the middle tier, we do have some small models that are working internally. Um, so when a user, user is logging in with Okta, and rather than using the Okta token, what we do is we swap that out with the LSWID document. Uh, LSWID stands for Lightweight Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. Again, if you're from Spiffy world, you're, you're familiar with SWIDs. So we basically added an extension to uh, SWID. So what happens is the asserting workload uh, asserts, it looks at all the claims and says, are you really who you say you are? And what is your device information? Are you, uh, are you signed? Okay, you're, uh, you're, you already follow zero trust principles and you have a document that uh, is telling you that you, you, you are who you say you are. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to extend that. And I'm going to tell that the next subsequent workload is going to be middle tier and it, it has already been identified. So subject workload takes that, it adds claims. And you might ask, what are these claims, right? These claims could be anything that could provide information about your runtime environment. Or these could be something in case of Spiffy world, these could be the selectors that you have used to attest a workload. Um, and, and then uh, the subject workload talks to middle tier, and when it comes to the uh, target workload, the target workload validates, is this a secure chain? And has, has the context been tampered with or did, uh, uh, did any lineage break here? Because what cryptographic lineage asks you is for the, uh, the workload has to have a sequence. It has to go from A to B to C. Let's say some hacker tries to s s somehow steal one of your certificates and try to interject immediately the signature is no longer valid because the chain has been broken and the signature fails. Um, th that's one way where we the notion of lateral movements are taken away. The second aspect that we, can, uh, uh, that we are doing is we are introducing an intent-based access because let's say you're a CFO of a company and you know that you're going to get fired and you want to short your stocks and Suddenly, you'd go and tend to, um, tend to uh, download a whole bunch of stuff, right? Suddenly, what this ecosystem does is it says, every day, your typical interactions are you go from a service and you access certain kind of data. But suddenly, today, you're just asking for a whole bunch of other data. Your context has changed. We don't see the mapping. So maybe it could be an alert or it could be a prompt. To, your, uh, to get approval from your supervisor, right? So, okay, uh, I'm sorry, with the respect to time, let me get into the demo real quick. Um, uh, so here uh, we have a, a simple a application. Uh, I'm just going to use my Okta um, to log in here. And uh, can, can everyone uh, look at the font? Is it, good? yep, awesome. So I'm just going to delegate my authentication. Here I have the information saying um, uh, this is my audience, which is a next service that I'm talking to, and I've used a Google token. Uh, sorry, uh, um, oh, I have used a authentication token from uh, Google to uh, authenticate. So what I'm going to do here is just go and um, uh, do a prompt, which is like, okay, tell me about CNCF. Security con. Okay. So uh, what it's going to do is go and uh, go through multiple service hops and uh, give you uh, give you the answer. Uh, so let's focus on what went on here behind the scenes. So when I go to this dashboard with the service map, I have user, I have web front end, business logic, and business logic uh, is talking to the OpenAI service. Um, but as I scroll through this, here, um, when I go to the backend, backend service specifically, I have a bunch of payloads. And what these payloads are, are they actually are telling you how the request has tr uh, tr uh, traveled through and what did we get, right? For example, in this case, it says that the request has been processed by an entity um, that has a TPM fingerprint which says that you know exactly that is the device that actually made a prompt. 
Uh, and then uh, as we go into multiple services, suddenly you have a whole bunch of information. Uh, but for the, for the fun of it, let's actually go and uh, dig deeper. So here, I have, uh, let's look at what are some of the uh, services that are uh, running here. Okay, we have get pods, okay. And uh, let me look into the backend service here. So there's a whole bunch of garble data here. Uh, please uh, ignore this because we, uh, We've just basically encoded and decoded every, um, every interaction that's happening. But something to pay attention to here is the caller LS width, which is the format that I was talking to you about. It's an encoded JOT. Uh, now, we're also working on multiple formats. Um, uh, basically, again, uh, this model follows the Spiffy model. So here, I have this encoded JOT. So if I go and look to see what's in this JOT, right? You can see here that we have a token structure. We have a token structure which is actually, which has this multiple nested, uh, uh, nested model, which is actually saying that I have a initial request, and here is the key to validate that initial request. And what we are doing is we are taking that and we are embedding that as we send the request all the way through to the end, uh, end state. So, Let's do this. So here, initially, when we asked for the prompt, I do have a TPM fingerprint of the device and a claim that says, tell me about CNCF security conference. Now you know that you have a cryptographic ledger, uh, cryptographic document that exactly says what the prompt was. And as we go, um, more deeper and go to the result, suddenly we have, uh, we have information that has actually uh, been processed and we have a uh, response. So in here, let me do this, Jason. Oops, sorry. Okay, I don't know if you can see this graph um, here, but basically what we have done is the entire nesting of the token along with the bundle that gives you the complete cryptographic nature of how the transaction went from one step to other step. And this is going to get like, um, oops, sorry. You can completely go and look at every request which has a signature to validate the sanctity of the request, and the cryptographic proof that nothing has been tampered with as the transaction has processed through. Now, let's say there has been a, uh, maybe a, some anomaly, right? This LSWID lets you pinpoint to what has happened all through the scenes. Uh, so, as an example here, um, there could be one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one request from one of your uh, um, either CIO, uh, CIO or CISO, right? Example could be Microsoft recently announced that they are going to indemnify your, uh, if you have used any OpenAI or GitHub code, they're going to indemnify you, right? Uh, but they're going to ask for a proof, like what is the prompt that you gave and what are the data sources did you give for a certain particular outcome? Suddenly, what we have here is a cryptographic lineage document that shows what the prompt was, what was the sanctity of each and every system uh, that led to a particular outcome. And at the same time, while, while not only are you providing the monitoring uh, and observability, cryptographic observability of, a, of your, your AI components, you're also providing a secure by design components by enabling that MTLS uh, features. So with respect to time, um, I know uh, I just, uh, I wanted to show a few more things, but I'm looking at the time. Uh, 
This format of, um, this is uh, one of the formats that is being worked out by the Whimsy Working Group. It's an IETF charter. So this, uh, and there are some, uh, some big players that are partaking as part of this charter. Uh, so if you want to partake, please um, feel free to join one of these uh, groups um, where you can contribute and you can have your say on how that format has to look like. Um, again, the foundation of this comes from the SPIFI. Uh, and I wanted to definitely thank a lot of these cryptographers that have been working on this for almost like two years now. Uh, also, uh, Spiral has been continuously engaged in this, uh, and we also wanted to thank uh, CNCF. So, any questions? Yep. Yeah, great question. Uh, so uh, the question was, how do you, um, like, um, maybe how do you differentiate between the data that model was trained on and uh, the source data that the model was trained on and the data? So let's say you're to use this mechanism and you're training your model with a certain data entities and certain algorithms, right? So what, we, uh, what we'll do is basically typically take the hash of the data uh, that, is uh, um, that is being used to train the model, and you make that hash as part of your uh, model signature, as part of your model version. So there are tools today, like uh, uh, Witness, or Testify Sex Witness, and then there are other tools that actually uh, embed that hash as part of your model supply chain. And what happens is when you have that entire cryptographic uh, signature of your model, Let's say someone is trying to, uh, let's say you have a poison model. Suddenly, the signature of the poison model is different. Now, as you dig through and look at what is the supply chain uh, for the model that was trained and what is the existing cryptographic hash of the existing model, suddenly you can, uh, you can actually pinpoint what, what is the component that was used to poison a model. But however, the most important thing is, you when you are training the model, you have to account for the hashes of the data that were being used, and also the versions of the uh, uh, algorithms that were being used. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can't have the entire data, right? Yeah. yeah, we can, definitely we cannot have because that could be terabytes. So what we'll do is just get a hash of that and, Okay, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. The provenance, right? Because uh, if you're using this model of uh, cryptographic lineage, suddenly you do know the provenance of the request. At least the pro uh, when the, uh, especially when it comes to the po uh, provenance, you know that every entity that's part of your ecosystem has been allocated a spiffy identity, which means it has been attested and verified. So you're getting the data from a trusted entity. So pro uh, and. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you consider that as an edge and have an identifier for that, right? Uh, no, that was the case, uh, use case where, with something like Anthem where they were connecting to multiple uh, external entities. How would you identify these edge entities, right? So you treat that as a edge entity and you issue an identity. So anything that's coming from there is now accountable. Yeah. Um, Yes, sir. All this work um, that we are doing is based on macarons and biscuits project. 
So yes. Uh, uh, and basically, we've actually, uh, because the uh, implementation, uh, implementation aspect is we started with the foundation of Spiffy, and then on top of it, we used the concept of macarons to, uh, to actually pass this information along. And that's where, when you see the identity mode, uh, that's what it is. And, but unfortunately, the identity mode is not as scalable because the amount of, uh, the amount of signatures that you have and the amount of validation work is extremely complex and challenging. It induces latency. So what we've come up with is anonymous mode, and um, there is also a hybrid mode, which actually combines the notion of anonymous and identity mode. So it is an extension to Macron's work. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what I was talking about is, yeah, this is the one. Uh, so you have, basically, you have a uh, signature, uh, the first claim with the signature ID1 and the audience, and then, on, uh, and then you have another verification with a signature identity two. Uh, and, but the most important thing is you also have to have a signed audience, which says this is where, uh, these, are, uh, these are the folks that are going to validate your uh, claim. And the anonymous mode is where we extract half of the key uh, and then build, um, build another. Uh, so there are this partial signature with the aggregation key. Uh, it's again, con snore concatenation. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for asking me.